Hi, I'm Bruce. Welcome to day 22. We're coming up on the home stretch of our 23 day journey. Today we're going to be discussing God's sovereignty. But before we do, let's spend time reflecting on Matthew 10 verses 29 through 31. Many theologians would argue that no doctrine is more despised by our mind than the truth that God is sovereign. Our human pride loathes the suggestion that God orders everything, controls everything, and rules over everything, even the number of hairs on our head. So let's begin with the definition. The definition I'm working with states, the sovereignty of God is the same as the lordship of God, for God is the sovereign over all of creation. The major components of God's lordship are his control, his authority, and covenantal presence. The sovereignty of God is the fact that he is the Lord over all creation. He is ultimately exercising his rule. This rule is exercised through God's authority as king, his control over all things, and his presence with his covenantal people and throughout his creation. The divine name Yahweh expresses his sovereign rule over against the claims of human kings. Because God is personal, his sovereign control is not impersonal or mechanical, but it is loving and gracious oversight of the king of creation and our Abba Father. I believe this is why I find it so personal when I begin prayer with the salutation, King Jesus. I'm a bit different than the theologians who struggle with God's sovereignty. I find it wildly comforting, and I, and I rest in the assurance that he is God and I am not. The Apostle Paul anticipated the argument against divine sovereignty. In Romans 9, verse 19, it states, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? In other words, doesn't God's sovereignty cancel out human responsibility? But rather than offering a philosophical answer, Paul simply re reprimanded the skeptic, saying, On the contrary, who are you, a man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay? to make from that same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. Above all, we must not conclude that God is unjust because he chooses to extend grace on some but not everyone. God is never to be measured by what seems fair to human judgment. Are we so foolish as to believe that we who are fallen and sinful have a higher standard of what is right than an unfallen and infinitely eternally holy God. What kind of pride is that? In Psalm 50, 21, God says, You thought that I was just like you, but God is not like us, nor can he be held to human standards. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's Isaiah 55. R.C. Sproul writes, Those who understand God's sovereignty have joy even in the midst of suffering, a joy reflected on their faces, for they see their suffering is not without purpose. We step out of bounds when we conclude that anything God does isn't fair. In Romans 11, verse 33, the apostle writes, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? That's Romans 11, 33 through 34. Friends, this day, let us rest in the wonderful truth 
that God's sovereignty is so much greater than our mind and our heart's grasping of what is best and what is fair. Again, the greatness of his understanding of all creation makes him worthy of all our adoration and obedience. J.R. Packer states, concludes ultimately, men treat God's sovereignty as a theme for controversy, but in scripture, it is a matter for worship. Today, let us worship our King.